Good morning, folks. It is February 1st, 2022. This is the Podman community meeting. This meeting is held on an every other month basis on the beginning of the even numbered months, the first Tuesday of that month. We um, have topics driven by requests that are given to me or to others. At the end of this meeting, we'll ask for some as well. Discussions are accepted for Podman, Builda, Scopio, or any other related container projects. And we have a meeting notes are in our HackMD. So if you have not yet, please go ahead in there, get in there and sign in as being present today. For our topics today, ooh, we have a typo, I'll fix that. We have, I'm gonna do just a quick pitch on the containers plumbing days, which is coming up shortly. And we'll have Podman on Windows from Jason Green and then Podman desktop demo and Hopefully, I'm not butchering Ianet's name, but from Ianet Stoshia. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, then network update from Matt Hian, and then topics for next meeting, which will be on Tuesday, April 5th. So with that, I'm going to add train over here. Oh, hello. Container Plumbing Days is coming up on March 22nd to 23rd. We have a number of um, topics that we're looking for. If you have a proposal that you'd like to add to that, we would love to have you there. Jason and Annette, the talks you joined today would be great there if you were interested. And then um, for anybody else that has topics that are similar to those or differently or any of the other topics here, please go ahead and consider adding it, um, adding yourself to that. It's going to be held, I think, um, from nine in the morning to about two in the afternoon on March 22nd and 23rd, and that'll be East Coast time. So that's the little pitch that I have for that. And so with that, I am going to stop sharing. And I'll ask Jason to talk about where we're at with Podman on Windows. Pro Thanks, Tom. And just so you guys know, I, I had a brief network blip. So if something goes wrong, I'll rejoin right away. Um, hopefully it, it was, it, I don't think it was on my end. I think it was on, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so one second, let me get my uh, screen share going here. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Looks good here. Okay, awesome. All right, so um, if you guys didn't see, um, there's a couple of videos um, I did that were posted on the Podman community uh, channel on YouTube that sort of shows uh, some other aspects of the, the work on Windows. Um, so today I'm just going to do a, just a brief uh, demo over the, some of the differences, uh, the big piece being that we now have uh, API forwarding. Um, so to start off with, um, I've got my uh, Windows PowerShell prompt running in Windows Terminal. And I just do the typical, uh, so Podman machine start. And then, you know, what this is gonna do is it's gonna fire up the uh, WSL instance in the background. Um, the very first time this runs, it has to start a virtual machine. So there is a little bit of a longer uh, time delay on that initial run, and then it's, it's faster after that. And then once we have the display, or once we have the actual um, uh, machine starting, then we'll get a notification that it says that the machine is running. And then additionally, um, the new thing that, that we have now is that there's a, a notification about the uh, API forwarding and, and a Windows pipe address uh, that it's listening on. Um, so if, if you're using, um, you know, the traditional um, Docker-like uh, tools or APIs, they expect there to be either a Windows pipe on Windows at a predefined address, or if you're on Unix uh, system, there's a Unix socket uh, at a global location. And in this case, um, what we're seeing is where it's listening on the main one, so it says below that you don't need to set a Docker host, so now we can use uh, 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 Docker commands if we wanted to. So, I'm, but first I'm just going to go ahead and just do a, well, just to show you that we've got everything running. You can see there's uh, um, PodMPS is functioning. And then I'm going to pull up another prompt and we'll go into the Docker client here. Um, now, of course, the PodMPS command is much more, I think it's a richer experience than the Docker tool itself. So you wouldn't normally do this. I'm just showing you the compatibility. What's going to get more interesting is what I'll show in just, just a little bit. So if I do Docker version, for example, um, it's going to issue a request against that uh, Windows pipe. And you can see that uh, it's actually responding with um, from Podman directly. So this is running 3.44 on, on the back end there. Um, so, okay, great. But uh, let's, let's see. We can show you that it's actually, it'll actually execute, you know, we can, Run a container as well. So if I do uh, 
we'll say UPI 8 micro, and I'm just going to pull up a shell, then it'll, uh, we go right to the prompt there, but then if I, I can then see that if when I'm using my podman commands, I can actually see this is actually working. So it's all sharing the same stuff, so you can switch back and forth. Uh, so for, let's make it a little bit more interesting. Um, what I'm going to do is... If I look, at one of the things that's great about having API forwarding is that you can actually have um, APIs work against this. So this would be like traditional tools uh, that you might use, say, GUIs of some form or actually applications you're developing. Uh, now, in this case, I've got just a, a Java application. Now, I, I, normally I would use something that's a bit more um, automated and magical, like I'd be using like a Quarkus framework or test containers or something like that that would do all this for me. But just to kind of show you a little bit under the hood, I've got uh, just some direct API usage. So uh, this is simply just going to create a configuration here, and it doesn't need to specify any address because it's, everything is at that predefined address that I mentioned. Um, and then, um, you know, this is going to be like the raw level steps that uh, a container CLI would do, right? So the very first thing is going to happen is it's going to do a pull for the image, and then it's going to create a container, and then finally start the container. And uh, one of the other things that, that came into Windows is we now have um, uh, environmental variable support, uh, um, so which was, was previously missing. So um, now we can run something like, say, Postgres. Uh, and you know you can specify your base configuration for Postgres. It starts up the Postgres instance. And then this is just going to execute some commands against the database here. Uh, so this can do the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy book series uh, and table. So, uh, let's go ahead and um, run that, and I can show you how all that's going. If I do, so the container started, and you can see right here, there's the Postgres instances running, um, and it looks like I left my bash prompt here, so I can go ahead and get that. <laughs> Okay, so that's that's connected, and we can verify that the data was created successfully. So I'm just going to fire up my local, like a local GUI tool for working with the Postgres instance. And let's see, there's the books that it created. And I can go ahead and zoom in so you can actually see this. Um, so you can see that everything worked as expected. Now, of course, one of the things is, is this is showing you the case of where there's nothing that's currently using the the API pipe that's defined, so we're able to take advantage of that and use different tools and APIs and so on. Um, but what happens if something is using it? Like, let's say you're using another environment, um, NerdCTL or, or Docker or whatever, and it's got that port currently in usage. Or in this case, we can have multiple parallel Podman instances, so I'm going to go ahead and show what happens there. So if I uh, clear this out, and then I do um, Podman, we'll say machine start, and we'll start another instance I created. So this is going to start other, so you can have parallel instances running on Windows, uh, which could be useful if you wanted to do, um, you know, sort of like different profiles or whatever. Um, and what I can do here is it will say that there's something already using uh, the main Docker address, uh, so it's going to put a different one in there, and it's going to pick a name that's derived off of the Podman machine instance. So all I have to do is I can just cut and paste this little blurb here, and I'm going to pull up another uh, another window. And now I can, uh, let's, see, let's get to the Docker directory. Ah. So from here, I can now do other commands against that other instance as opposed to the one that I was currently running. So I'm just, well, let me just do PS. And you can see, yeah, there's no containers here yet in the other instance, or the, the main one we started, the default one. If I do a PS, you can see that Postgres is still running. So we've actually got two different parallel instances going. And the same thing on the Podman side, I could say uh, Podman, um, I could specify the other location. So you do dash C and then you specify your connection. And I can say, uh, let's do a PS here. And you can see there's nothing there. But then if I go over to my previous instance, I can I'll do the similar thing, UBI 8 micro and mash. Oh, I should make it interactive. And it's going to launch the shell. And um, now, in this case, because we're using a different machine, this one doesn't have UBI 8 pulled yet. So now it's going to repull it. And I can go and see that on the other instance, we have that bash instance running. And then if I switch to the default, it's going to show the, uh, the Postgres instance running.
Um, so, uh, okay, so how's this working under the hood? Essentially what's happening is Podman Machine is um, starting a separate API forwarding service. Um, and that service is uh, acts kind of like a Windows service, except it's, it's executed based off of the Podman command directly. Um, and if I wanted to see more details, like if I wanted to understand, like if there was an error or something like that, um, it's integrated into uh, the Windows event logging system. So you can do like your normal PowerShell commands. So I could say get win event. Um, and uh, it's not actually implemented using .NET, um, but it's a real complicated story with how event logs, they, they want a predefined profile installed on your system. Uh, so we just reuse .NET Road Time because it has exactly what we need. And then um, we, we want to order it correctly. And you can see uh, from the log here, you can see the two different um, instances running that it's listening on uh, whichever port. So if there was an error, you would see it here. And uh, you, can, you can see the processes. Um, it's called uh, win SSH proxy. And you could just, you know, kill it like any other normal um, process if you ever had to. But, of course, Podman Machine Stop um, would, uh, would end it as well. Uh, so that's it. So I just wanted to demonstrate that for you, that we have API forwarding, um, event is working. There's still some missing pieces that need to be done next. Um, while the underlying infrastructure is there to support um, the file system capability for, for volume mounts, uh, there is some extra code that needs to be written to translate the paths correctly so that a Windows path gets translated to a mount location. So just real quick, I can actually show you that. If I go to... Um, Say we'll, we'll pick Pavia Machine instance. So this is going to drop me right into the WSL environment. So this is the um, underlying Fedora instance that's running as the back end of those Podman clients. I can uh, from here I can actually see um, that there's the C drive um, that's that's available. So it's actually there. It's it, it's, and it's usable for the container. We just have to have that little bit of of bridge code. Uh, so that'll be something that um, I'll be taking a look at next. Um, so so Tom, that's that's pretty much all I had. Uh, unless you guys had any questions, or I think you have a question, an answer session at the end, so I could hang on for that as well. Okay, yeah, actually we do a question and answer right away for for the topic that was just presented. So if anybody has any right off the top of their heads. We're in silence. Look great to me. So thank you, Jason. I got a question. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, Brent, fire, before we move on. Um, you know, Jason, which socket are you are you exporting from the from WSL? Is it the root pool or rootless? It's the it's the root socket um, is currently okay. being exported. Um, the thinking I had behind that was that the uh, from a compatibility perspective, uh, from folks that are used to using um, you know the Docker APIs, they sort of expect that. Uh, rootful behavior. So if you're using something like, say, a compose workflow where you've got, you know, pods talking to each other, or, or sorry, uh, <laughs> containers talking to each other, um, then uh, it's useful to have that all working. And there's a few other, you know, well, you guys know all this stuff better than I do, but the, 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 like being able to like do sort of loopback mounting and that kind of stuff. Um, so that was my thinking there. Um, I mean, obviously, like uh, we could change that if we prefer. We could there could be a flag, for example, um, that's specified. Um, from a security perspective, I don't think there's a significant, um, you know, vulnerability surface because essentially everything is running under the user's identity. Um, so it's the WSL instance is actually running in a virtual machine that is tied to the user, and then all the distributions share that anyway. And then within that instance, you know, you you do have um, you know, you do have the containers could, could technically interfere with each other, but just having access to the same user means that it's pretty trivial to do to jump into another distribution right as root and do whatever you want to anyway. So, so I think it's fairly from a security perspective, I think it's safe. It's something we wouldn't want to do on a on a Linux <laughs> on a Linux local system, of course. Any other questions or follow up, Brent? I just want <clears throat> I just wanted to ask this is all in WSL right all the VMs were running in WSL That's correct yes so WSL was hosting um, both of those instances when I did uh, the original default one and then I did that other instance um, it was both using uh, two WSL instances and those are all running in that shared uh, WSL VM that I mentioned so they're they're kind of exact as if equivalent to a privileged container process is that's sort of how they implement it internally so they share the same Linux kernel 
and um, and so on. And, and that was using the um, previously I had used Slurp. On. In this case, it's using um, the uh, the the standard CNI um, stuff. So. And are you, are you just leaking to the Docker API? We're not leaking out the LibPod API. I just... That that is correct. It is simply mapping to um, to the Podman sock. So it's in run 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 Podman sock is what is mapped okay. to. You, the, said, you could have done you could have done a demonstration of Podman dash remote and had to talk to the socket and and it would have done correct stuff as well. It's just not yeah, so it's just leaking out the Podman socket, and it knows the difference between Docker API and Podman API. It, it, yes, exactly. And then, um, so the what what how it works as a as a proxy. So the um, the so it's basically doing a Windows pipe through SSH to the Podman sock, and then the Windows pipe is restricted to just the user and administrators. So another. Theoretically, another Windows user wouldn't have access to that uh, to that socket, so they would be or to that pipe, so they wouldn't be able to reach. Uh, so, so one one petition. Um, so Docker knows how to connect to that Docker socket, but Podman. So if we use LibPod PY, it wouldn't default to that location, right? Right, ex exactly. So we'd have to do some. Um, I mean, we could certainly add that um, to. Right. No, it might be something you want to add into Podman PY to figure out if it, if that's available. Or yeah, that's a good should, point. Well, we should have a socket that's named Podman socket or something. Yeah, one thing I want to sure is if socket. have two instances yeah. that we just default to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Look great. That's awesome. Thanks. All right, and then one last question, and then I'm going to move on to Ian, and since it's from Ian himself. He had one in chat that says, do volume mounts that are not from slash MNC work mount? Let's say home users projects. Um, so if I understand correctly, so that'd be on the, in the WSL instance, I think is your question, if it was in the Linux um, environment and there was a mount there, um, that should work. Um, and that's a good point because, um, you know, it, 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 may, it makes sense. So the, the, the way I had it in, essentially the way that this ultimately works is that what is specified on the Podman remote instance running on Windows is just passed to the Podman backend instance. Um, so the big change I plan to make is to have the remote know how to translate the Windows path to the mount location. So all we have to do is just if, it, if, it's, if it's a Unix location, just don't mount, modify it, just pass that straight through. And then you would get equivalent behavior because from the perspective of the Podman backend instance, it would just be doing the mount against the, the file system, the, the, the global file system path. So if, if I understand your, your, your question correctly, then the answer is yes, that should work. Um, and it's a good reminder that uh, when I look at that, that I should make sure it does. <laughs> okay, thank you. And a great demo once again. The uh, comments and chat are people uh, drooling over your ability to demo so well. So thank you for that, Jason. Yeah, um, you're up with Podman Desktop. We lost to you. You're speaking or saying anything in it, we're not hearing you. Still online, but not showing. Um, Matt, are you able to do a network update now? We'll move on to you and go back. <clears throat> uh, sure. Okay, let's see. Uh, there were supposed to be a demo as part of this, but uh, to be honest, I am buried under emails and I completely forgot when I got morning, so we'll just have to listen to me talk for a while. Uh, so, as some of you may know, we are doing a complete rewrite of the Podman network stack as part of Port Podman 4.0 as an optional alternative to CNI, basically because CNI was not covering some of the use cases that we really wanted to hit around DNS for containers, looking up container names from other containers. 
and also around IPv6, although recently we found that uh, CNI's v6 support has been improving. So the new stack is based on two new programs, which we call Netavark. That is basically the alternative to CNI at this point. It sets up the complete container network stack and tears it down at the end when you're done with the containers. And Ardvark. Ardvark is the DNS component thereof. Uh, we used to use uh, a existing DNS server, DNS mask, uh, and now we are using a dedicated DNS server that is a lot better suited to the container use case. We ran into a lot of issues with DNS when you had a container connected to multiple networks at the same time, whereas now we should be able to handle that much better. Uh, we are currently testing these extensively, and hopefully we should have them way to release alongside Podman 4.0 in the next few weeks. Uh, don't have an exact date yet, more of when they're ready, but we are actively testing them, and it seems to be going well so far. Finding bugs at a steady pace, fixing bugs at a steady pace. And by end of day, we should have a blog post out explaining how you can get your hands on these and test them. and any testing and feedback is going to be massively appreciated because we'd really like to get as many eyes on this as possible. But a general summary here, uh, if you're using Podman already and you upgrade from Podman 3 to Podman 4, you should see no change because we will continue using CNI as to not break you. Your existing containers will continue to use the CNI stack. Uh, Netavark is not intended to be run in parallel with CNI, so new installations get Netavark, old installations stay on CNI unless you explicitly opt to upgrade. Uh, Netavark has a number of features that are improvements over CNI, mostly around IPv6 support and DNS, although in the future we are also looking to improve our support for systems that run firewall D and NF tables, uh, not the initial release, but do enough, hopefully. Uh, Podman in general has gotten a number of changes to improve our support for networking. Mostly, again, around v6, we've implemented the hyphen hyphen IPv6 flag for static v6 addresses, finally. You can now set multiple static IP addresses on a container if it joins multiple networks. So you can have one static v4 and one static v6 per network you join. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good summary thereof. Expect a blog post by end of day, again, with details on how to get Netavark and Ardvark and how to get a latest Podman 4 RC no. to test with. Uh, if I may jump in real quick, um, Indrik and I just got Netavark RPM approved uh, through the Fedora review process. So it should land in Rawhide and Fedora 35, maybe in the next. So, yeah, that's about it. Okay, any questions about that or for Matt? And let's see, let's see some things going on in chat. No, you know, we can't hear you yet. So I'm going to turn it over to Ian and hopefully he's able to be heard and seen. I want to talk now. Nope. A question in the uh, chats about. Um, is Netavark based on similar kernel facilities as CNI? And according to Paul, it is. Uh, yes, uh, at least for now. As I said, eventually we're going to add support for NF tables. CNI right now is exclusively IP tables based. So eventually we'll be doing similar things to what CNI does, but using the new NF table stack. We're also going to be supporting Firewall D in a more native fashion where we don't actually the current implementation just uh, makes IP tables rules and allows everything from them through the firewall. Eventually, we're going to work within the firewall D framework and actually make firewall D rules so you can manage it through the firewall D command.
Any any better luck there? He's still here and he looks good as far as the network capabilities, but I'm not hearing him. And unfortunately, we also had a talk today scheduled for sparse file handling within Podman, but Giuseppe wasn't able to present today. So we're going to push that one out till the next time. See if Ian can get in. Yeah, says he can see see himself, but we can't hear or see him at all. We can open it up to discussion at this point, then. While he, yeah. I would not. Did you, can you switch browsers? Sometimes uh, tools work better on Firefox or Chrome or something different. Yeah, I generally have better luck with Chrome with with Blue Jeans. If you can try try Chrome, you know, see if that works any better for you. And perhaps this might be a good segue as far as procedural procedural Google Meet seems to have less problems, and we're not getting hundreds of people, which is what we had done the Blue Jeans for initially. So I might consider moving over to Google Meet again until we get to a point where we're getting too many to handle that load on Google Meet. So are there any discussion topics that we haven't gone about that people would like to talk about? Any questions? I guess uh, for, those, for those people who are using Fedora, we're gonna, um, it's gonna be a little strange with the update to Podman 4.0 because Podman 4.0 is the breaking change. We're not gonna be releasing it directly to Fedora 35. Um, it will be default on Fedora 36. Um, there will be a procedure to get it onto Fedora 35, but it'll be never released to Fedora 35 because uh, we're not supposed to make breaking changes on an API level during a Fedora release. Um, so, um, anyways, that's uh, just something you're not going to see in your updates chain. So people are going to have to manually pull it down if they want to run it on top of Fedora, Fedora 35. Is it okay to jump in with a question on voice about that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, cool. Uh, so I was just wondering, um, I know there was that thread that was talked about possibly having a parallel stream. Was it decided that wasn't going to, uh, that wasn't going to happen? We're just going to do like a wait for the next 36, and then if there's a Podman v5, then that would be like wait for 37 to try to. Yeah, the, 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 I, we're kind of against doing a parallel stream, mainly because our goal here is for the socket. And I don't know if you do a parallel stream, you know, which one gets the socket, right? So, so which one's going to get the default, so, you know, podman.sock. Um, so I don't know if that helps would, I mean, that's a lot of work and I don't see where that really helps help the situation. I think, I think people are either people with existing clients that are talking to the podman socket are going to want to stick with the existing clients. You know, Podman 3.4, and people who don't care about that are just going to upgrade to Podman 4. The problem, I wish there was a way, a better way in Fedora to be able to handle this, but it's almost like modules would have been the thing to handle this, but uh, that's sort of been killed. Yeah, I, yeah, I can understand why you guys uh, were kind of leery of that, just because like it's like if you you kind of have to pick one or the other up front for the initial provisioning, and then you have to wait for all the packages to download. That's one of the things that is not, uh, from like a UX perspective on the Windows side, is it has to, since it's starting from the one sort of container-based image for Fedora, it, there's a quite a bit of package installation work. And I imagine with FCOS and Linux, you'd have, if you were installing a, another Podman instance, it probably would add some time for that package installation. Well, you'd have so, to. You'd have to again. It's what what is the default, default Podman command point to, and what is the default Podman socket? 
So if I if, if we had parallel, you know, would you want to have to type in Podman four every time you typed in Podman? Um, and so it, it's just it's just too bad that we're sort of in this tweener time. You know, as we get close, March 15th is going to be the release of the beta release of Fedora 36. And a lot of people will start jumping at that point, at which point it'll become moot at that point. But, um, but we're, we're two months away from that. So it's kind of a, you know, we're in a tough time now. Do, do you, are you going to try to uh, align the schedule or something like that with four? So like four would be released, um, around the same time as the 36 and they would be sort of pulled together or is it going to be like a stair step or something? To get, four, to get four out as soon as possible because four is also going to show up in RHEL and we'd like to have the more open source use on four before we, you know, agree to support it for the next several years. So it's sort of, so we're in, a, we're in between a rock and a hard place. Um, you know, so it's, I think a, a lot of people, we're going to set up a copper um, place where you can download Podman 4 for, um, for Fedora 35 and just ask people to, to use that. The rest of the packages should be available in Fedora, just Podman can't go in oh, Fedora 35. Okay, I promise my last question <laughs> is um, from the API breakage perspective. Um, is it is it pretty significant? Is it uh, like a some dramatic changes, or is it just like there may be a few places where things broke compatibility, and so you might be okay? Uh, there are dramatic changes in the networking endpoints and the manifest endpoints, and I want to say the image endpoints might have some uh, pretty significant ones as well. But networking required a complete rewrite for the new stack and manifests. Uh, frankly, we were not proud of our manifest endpoints before, and we have fixed them up so they're a lot cleaner now. Uh, so those two are pretty significant. I think there was some general ones in, in containers and images as well. So there's, there's enough that where the breakages would, would just tick people off. So I was saying that, yeah, 75% of your scripts will continue to work. It's probably not enough. Yeah. yeah, I was just curious if it was a small thing or not. So it's not small. <laughs> Although yeah. I guess in, it, people who are using um, like the, uh, I guess the compatibility API, they're probably okay. Cause um, yeah, they're, they're fine. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the actual the place where people get mostly going to see the breakage is in actually on a Mac or um, well not less so on a the Windows. So what doesn't really have the problem because you're using real Podman. So it's, it's Podman remote. Using a Podman remote against a Podman 3.4 is going to be breakage and vice versa. If you're using a 3.4 against the Podman 4 server. Um, this, this breakage. We pr we promise a year or two from now when we do Podman five, we'll do a better job of backwards compatibility. Hey, sorry, folks. I'm working with Janet, and he's talking on blue jeans and presenting on um, <laughs> Google Meet at the moment. Can, can we hear now? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hear you. We hear a voice. Okay, okay. So it means that the blue jeans works. <laughs> Uh, can you oh my, can you share I, on blue jeans? Yes, yes. I'm going to finally do the presentation. I'm really sorry about this. I don't know what's oh, going on. Okay. We've had problems in the past with blue jeans being a little persnickety, shall we say? Okay, so let me start quickly. Share screen there because I'm quite new to to this world. So quick, some quick words. We are seeing things perfectly now. Okay. okay. And you can also hear me, I guess. Yes, and we can hear you fine as well. So th okay. thank you for pers persevering. First, uh, thank you, Jason. You have awesome news, especially for this case that you're going to see very soon. So uh, quickly, quick intro about me. A software dude living in Belgium, working for the last 10 years. 
And my initiative is actually Podman Desktop Companion. It's a equivalent GUI for that familiar interface that you guys all know. It's supposed to target all operating systems and all desktops in a very similar way because there is a lot of friction when developers switch from UI to another, from operating system to another to be able to test and to check their work. Uh, my main target is actually full stack developers, but of course it's for any developers, for those that are more advanced or want to learn about this all this uh, container world and not get lost into terms. And the goals that I had when I created this was really this was the main one to have a identical look everywhere on all the operating systems. As of course, respecting those idioms that are very specific to, to an operating system not to revolutionize the entire world. Uh, I want to reach parity as soon as possible with that familiar UI. This for me means as soon as possible add some uh, Kubernetes pods actually uh, support for management. And then the next goals that really keep me from releasing uh, binaries for Windows and Mac. Actually the first one for Windows is find a way to communicate with the REST API which J Jason just presented now with that uh, Windows socket. As I digged myself, but I've looked at it's only recent that they support AF Unix sockets in the Windows, I think on Windows 10, I don't know what build, but now it's possible. So we can do a secure connection to the APIs from the natively running GUI to the VM. And then it was the native volumes. Uh, at this phase, I'm really happy that at least even if it's so the MNT paths are, are blocking for some time, but that's not a big deal because in any way, uh, the other file system mounts normal are very fast. So it's a typical scenario for Windows folks to, to develop and keep their projects inside native uh, VSL folders. Okay, and then for the Mac OS, it's the same situation. Actually, Lima does support folders, but I have to find a way to communicate with the socket. And this is still in so when I started the project, I tried several approaches on UI development. So I tried the, the native ones, they all have their goods and bad. In the end, actually it's about what I know how to do the best and how mature the, the world around it is. And speed of development was also a big concern, how fast we have that retry loop. And in the end, uh, so I went through the hurdles of trying to do something that is as cross-platform as possible. I went to something that is very early from my, my life as a programmer, doing uh, Lazarus, had some patches early in, in Free Pascal to actually support Unix socket connections for the HTTP client. But it's quite a hurdle. And actually, there are just some, not so many guys that are present in this active scene. So other trials, I went to try GTK, but with GTK I had my own issues, mostly related to, to packaging and to deploying to other operating system. Although this, the high level integration or operating system, I don't need that that much for this type of UI that you see soon. But actually bundling them and preparing a package for other things than the Linux, it's not that easy. And also it's very difficult to work with APIs Especially I had this, I mean, I, they could have been overcome, but actually for one person to deal with so much in their time, it's not that, not that fun. And in the end, I went to whatever everyone is doing these days, the most dreadful and hated Electron apps. So it's an Electron application, actually, and uh, it does look the same on every operating system. It has exactly the same code base on every operating system, and it's very easy to build UI and extend it. Of course, it's a huge application, like this compared to if you create a GTK app, it's probably 200 kilobytes, 100 megabytes every time. The thing is that with the new approaches on deployment and shipping apps that are recommended to us, it's actually very similar. It arrives in the end to the same type of sizes because it's not just the app, it's the entire thing that runs the app. I'm still exploring other more lightweight ways to package it. But in, meanwhile, this is this is what I uh, arrived to do, uh, Electron application. And the immediate goals that I have for it is actually to expose, because these are the most demanded from 
everyone that appeared corporate world is uh, Windows and Mac binaries. And uh, this is my main focus right now. I have this uh, branch started in, in the project. It's called support Windows, but it's not really about Windows only. It's support Windows and, and Mac. And I, after that, I will open the GitHub issues because there were so many so far. Request that it would have only polluted the entire GitHub with only these two things of supporting Windows and Mac. And then the plan is to, to make more noise, publish about this project in more places, write some 10 articles with the most, uh, most useful, let's say, scenarios that developers are looking for and convert them to Podman and Podman specifics. And the next is actually to, to deal with Podman Compose because Docker Compose is something that is also very, very seeked for by everyone because of how they sh uh, store infrastructure in their code. And I want to, to have a deeper integration to that. And then try to deal with the client, not to re implement my client every time because uh, the API REST for API follows Swagger specification and Swagger recently updated their client generators. And that's high quality enough for the task. Then would be to have testing, uh, remote client support, so to be able to also do remote connections and a tighter integration with the entire Podman team because I should follow every version now manually so that I make sure I don't break the app if users switch versions, but at one point this will happen. So the versions releases must, must sync somehow. And a huge thanks for all the guys that helped me with my, my crazy project and done mostly in late night. So now I'm going to, to present a little bit the application. Thank you for this. And I hope it all works fine. There it is, booting up. Okay, so. And just to confirm, we're seeing that as well. Okay, so it's, uh, as you know it, of course, I copied the command to the shell, and now I launch it. And meanwhile, I should get. I already sorry, I already have it on this port, so I can just switch the port to minutes, save this. And now we already have three containers. That's it. One did not this did fail because I was using the same port, but the others are there. And you can do the operations that you expect. In the logs, this one does, doesn't have actually anything. This one. And some information about the environment, some stats for system that supports each groups, P2. I'm actually on Manjaro right now, and this one supports it. I have to do some there. And that things you are dropped into a shell, this one, and, and so on. So it's like basically a CMS for, for Podman API. Uh, our images, the images that are running, you can actually spawn on this one, another, another container, ports, and actually this will come very soon once we are able to, to have mounts to support everywhere. So only knows this works, but as soon as possible, we release it for the rest. Oh, that's it, and we have our extra container. There it is, I think. Uh, secrets management place, machines which are specific to Podman only, volumes, this will come soon. Enable those things that as soon as possible we have also the pods here. And some way to, to distribute collections of setups for developers to share, how they have it on, on their own machines. An integrated info system, some helpful facilities to jump into the help, the online links, way to reset your system. Enough that's going on. And that's about it from me about this beautiful app. Are you looking at adding uh, the ability to push and pull images and build container images? Actually, it's already there. Yes. It's already there, but you have to set have your machine set up with the proper credentials. And probably I'll have to add some additional GUI for it. But for now, it just replicates the commands that you would do normally on the command line. You have the ability to build a container? Not yet. Okay.
Okay, so it worked. Yeah, uh, it's making great progress. Um, does anybody have any questions for Ian? Or are you questions or discussions? Are you executing the Podman command underneath the covers? Are you talking to the Podman API? With the API, actually, I start with a, I start the system service listening to a socket, and then I connect directly to the socket with the HTTP client using the Unix socket. I, I did it in the beginning, but that's where Anders really showed me the way, showed me the path, because that was not secure. I was starting an HTTP server, and that, that was not a good practice. I know the others also moved to Unix sockets for communication. It would have much easier, for example, for the Windows case right now to do a, an HTTP connection. But now that I know what Jason did, it's all good. No yeah. progress on the Windows. And do you handle rootful and rootless? One is rootless. You're yeah, just handling rootless right now. Okay. And for the Lima machine, it will uh, export the Unix socket by default using SSH. So it's available on your Mac in a directory. Awesome. Now only good news, guys. Thank you very much. Very soon that I will be able to release Mac and Windows binaries. Thank you. And there is also a one-click Podman install. So if you're not happy with the default or container D, you can uh, uh, easily select Docker or Podman instead. And then it's installed on your cloud init-based OS. For the most seamless experience, I guess there should be some talks that say to be able to somehow bundle everything in one package or have some scripts to automate this installation of the desktop app and uh, compose alternative and podman and limo and vsl images on windows of course that could be a perfect place to collaborate because then it becomes very easy for the users to feel into this we had a question from jason in chat about are you aiming for parity with the command line or just main task uh, I'm for, in the beginning. I'm aiming for those things that are present in the familiar app, just to know that I cover what what the guys expect. But then is I want to decorate it as much as um, as many cases as possible that are really specific to Podman itself, and that has show Podman's power against everything. So if it makes sense to expose all CLI, I will do it. But I think here we deal with more high-level concepts than, than just exposing the CLI. What I would really want to do is offer an UI that also shows the guys what the equivalent command would be. Because in this way, you visually learn also what the CLI should receive as input. That's, that's great for as a learning tool. Would you like to get the package your repo underneath the containers repo absolutely i do not know what the procedure is but absolutely of course all right can you just send me email at dwalsh at red about it yeah i'm not sure I put the email in the chat for Dan. Any other questions, general or not, or topics for next time, which will be in two months, on March 5th, I believe. And, and Brent also requested that you ping him as well. And he's put his email in, in the chat as well, the Google chat. <laughs> yes, he has a very good point. Just uh, BCC Dan, because you're going to be talking to Brent. <laughs> All righty. Well, I think, since there are no more questions and we're wrapping up, um, just for a little fun thing, I threw an Easter egg out in the chat, out in the um, HackMD chat if you want to take a look at it. If not, no worries. 
And I'd like to thank everybody who came today and presented to us. They were all great presentations and to the folks for attending here. Again, we're going to be meeting on next time on April, April 5th, I think I said March a few moments ago, April 5th, 11 o'clock again, in our cabal meeting will be coming up in just a couple of weeks, February 17th at 11 a.m. And that's on a different uh, channel, um, different meeting that's actually on Gmeet, so that would probably be a little bit easier. And please also keep in mind the um, plumbing, yeah, Containers Plumbing Conference, which is coming up on March 22nd, 23rd, and we'd love to have some people go ahead and present there. So with that, I'm going to stop the recording.